If you cannot hear me, tell me. So this is the, uh, the talk about the Mod Proxy cookbook, and it's a collection of recipes and some overview uh, of the proxy module. I'd like to thank Rich and Jim, or uh, sorry, Jim and Rich, Rich and Jim, same thing, but in different order, because uh, Jim went first in his presentation for plugging my own. Uh, so we'll start out, who am I? Uh, my name is Daniel Ruggieri. I am an infrastructure guy. So I'm the poor guy that Jim was talking about earlier in his presentation. Uh, so anything that speaks web, uh, I do that for a day job at MasterCard. Uh, I hang out in the developer list and the users list, and I actually do read every email that comes to the developer list. Unfortunately, most of the time, I don't comprehend all of it. Uh, and I've written code in a lot of different languages. Uh, I'm a committer on the HTTPD project for about maybe three or four years now. Uh, and I learned a really cool trick. If I put this disclaimer in my slide, the communications and the legal team stop reading my presentation immediately so I can do whatever I want after that. Um, I will point out we're hiring web admins at MasterCard if anybody wants to relocate to St. Louis or New York. Cool stuff. So what are we going to talk about? Um, we're talking about the mod proxy module, uh, but the thing that makes it so useful isn't necessarily mod proxy in and of itself, but it's all the other stuff that HTTP brings to the table. Um, so it's not just about mod proxy. Uh, it's important as we talk about all these topics that you really know your application, know what it's going to do, know what it likes, know what it doesn't like, uh, because some of these recipes just plain may not work for you or could cause problems. Uh, there is a warning for eye charts ahead. I saw Jim put his glasses on. Um, the examples may be hard to read, uh, but they're all in the presentation. Uh, and I ask you to download the presentation because I have more content than time. Uh, and I have version information as well as um, new stuff. And then some supplemental data in the slide notes when you do get the, uh, the presentation. But everything's in there for completeness. So be sure to download the presentation. So, what makes for a good proxy? Well, these are the things I consider very important for a proxy. There's connection marshalling, like protocol enforcement. Uh, there is load balancing and session stickiness. This is, without a doubt, my favorite part. Uh, there is connection pooling, which is also very important in a proxy scenario. And then failover and health monitoring. We're going to talk about that as well. Uh, caching and compression. We're all good members of the Internet Society, so we're going to send less data than we really need to if we can. And TCP and SSL offload is also important in a proxy scenario. Uh, and again, being members of the internet community, we're also getting attacks all the time. So a proxy needs to be able to fend away from attacks. I, I work at MasterCard. I get lots of attacks. Uh, and then traffic shaping. That's a big deal. Uh, and we'll talk about some really great use cases there. Uh, I do want to point out, HTTPD is just a tool in the toolbox. It may not be the best proxy for you. For my money, it really is. Uh, there is a talk later today, maybe tomorrow, about how to select a proxy. Uh, I encourage you to check it out. Uh, so we're going to jump straight into the connection marshalling and, and playing traffic cop, as I like to call it. So mod proxy can perform as a forward or a reverse proxy. And for those who aren't aware, uh, of the difference between a forward and a reverse proxy, uh, it, it really boils down to what the client knows. So does the client know that there's a proxy there? Yes. Then it must be a forward proxy, because you talk to a forward proxy differently than you do to a reverse proxy. Um, in a reverse proxy, the client doesn't know any better. It doesn't know, doesn't necessarily care. Uh, so I do have some examples uh, coming up that kind of show the differences. And in the slide notes, uh, there are Example requests so that you can see uh, the difference in how it goes through uh, the proxy. So I want to point out in a forward proxy, you're going to use mod proxy connect for SSL uh, because you're going to be actually establishing, establishing a TCP tunnel through the proxy. And then reverse proxy uses mod proxy and then a whole host of supporting modules to implement the different protocols. Uh, I mean, that, that list is impressive and it's growing. So we, we take our proxy seriously. Uh, you use SSL proxy engine, there's a directive uh, that implements the SSL portion of the proxy in mod SSL uh, for a reverse proxy scenario. I do want to point out um, 
the proxy will add on an HTTP or an HTTP request by default. There are three headers, and I have them noted in here. Uh, that it will add for the X forwarded host server and X forwarded for. So just keep those in mind. They will show up on your back end and they can be very useful. So we'll jump right into an example of a forward proxy. Uh, before I even say anything further about a forward proxy, we all can agree that forward proxies that are open and wide on the internet are a very bad thing. Okay, if anyone's not sure why, I will be more than happy to tell you in volume. But the point is, do not enable your forward proxy unless you've restricted it to a specific network or perhaps authorization. We've got a whole slew of great modules that can restrict access to the proxy. I really need you to do that before you turn the module on to allow the forward proxy. So we're just going to throw up a virtual host in this example. And inside there, we just turn on proxy requests. And you're pretty much done. Uh, you will need to have Mod Proxy Connect loaded, as I mentioned earlier, if you want to support SSL traffic. And uh, HTTPD also has the ability to act as a client to a forward proxy as well. So in the client scenario, Apache has the proxy remote directive that points out, here's my target proxy server. I can't get to the internet natively, but I can through this forward proxy. Uh, and that's really the use case for a forward proxy. You have a client that may be in a you know, segregated environment, a special network, something. You don't want to give them direct internet access, so you direct them through the proxy so you can restrict where they can go. The next example I have up on screen is our simple reverse proxy. And I'll point out there's two ways to implement a reverse proxy in Apache. You have the location syntax and the proxy pass syntax. Uh, as I understand it, location is actually slightly faster Jim gives me a nod. Uh, proxy pass, on the other hand, I, maybe Jim will know, uh, I think you can manage balancer manager stuff with a proxy pass, but not with the location. Okay, so don't listen to what I say, listen to Jim. He knows this stuff. Uh, but the syntax is very straightforward, right? You define your location, and you say, this path goes to this backend. Uh, similar with the uh, proxy pass, and in the uh, slide notes, I do have an example of a uh, request showing that the client really doesn't know any different. It thinks it's talking to the origin server. It thinks it's talking to Dan's really cool website.com. So new in 2.4 is WebSocket support. So I, has anyone here used, implemented, heard of WebSockets? Okay, so for those who haven't, they're really cool. All right, so you understand HTTP is a request response cycle. Uh, that can be kind of cumbersome if you want to do real time updates. If you don't know the next time you want to write or the next time you want to read, you just want to have a socket. Well, that's what the WebSocket RFC adds. So it's a full duplex socket. It's established over HTTP. So you start with a normal HTTP request and you, you indicate that you support WebSockets with an upgrade um, in the connection HTTP header. And then you slap on a couple of other WebSocket specific headers and lo and behold, magic happens and you suddenly have a full duplex bi-directional socket that you can do stuff with, whatever your application does. Uh, so in the examples here, uh, in the slide deck, I do have an example of an HTTP upgrade. I personally don't have a lot of use cases for this. Um, we, uh, we have some guys in the MasterCard labs toying around with this technology, so I'm going to be playing with this a lot more. But right now, the only example I have is from the, uh, what was it, the websocket.org ping test. It's just an echo socket, not too, uh, not too fancy. Uh, the next one, this is super cool. I have a really great uh, use case to share later on in the presentation about UDS, Unix domain sockets. So what is a Unix domain socket? First off, it's an HD, or it's a simple socket, but it doesn't have all that TCP stuff around it, right? What's a TCP handshake? It's three steps just to begin, and every time you send a packet, you gotta acknowledge that packet. There's a lot of chit chat that goes back and forth. And if you need to talk locally, this is so much more efficient. It's simply open the file and start writing to it, right? So in a, in a Linux implementation, everything's a file. Well, this is a socket that is a file that you don't have to worry about the TCP overhead. So I have a really cool example of this actually in use. 
Um, the separator, uh, the, the proxy pass line, and Jim had an example of this uh, earlier. Um, you have the Unix colon slash, should that be double slash? I don't remember. Uh, but it's a path to your socket, and then after that, there's a pipe separating it from you know, all the normal HTTP stuff. So in this example, I'm gonna have localhost as my HTTP host header on the request that makes it to the UDS. Another cool one, they must be cool because Jim mentioned it also, and I think Rich might have, Mod Proxy Express uh, is basically a mass name-based proxy virtual host. And this is where the eye chart kind of comes into play. I don't know how well that's visible. Uh, but it's really cool. You have a mass name-based switch like. So you think of a switch statement and in your favorite programming language, that's what it is. Um, target server selection is driven by the DBM file. Uh, and the implementation of the file is actually very simple. Uh, as shown in the previous examples, you just have a host and then you have a back end. So you can make your proxy, your big old proxy, right at the edge of your network, a broker for all kinds of different back ends. And also, as mentioned earlier, uh, this is very dynamic. You make a change to the DBM file, HTTP picks it up and starts using it, and your new back end is now in service or no longer in service. Um, I learned today that there are going to be some enhancements. Uh, that we can add some of the proxy pass directives on top of here, which is really awesome. Um, there is a point to make that, I don't know what that was. Uh, you have to run the HTTP2 DBM uh, program to map the file so it's in a, a machine readable format. Now we get into my favorite part, load distribution. Using mod proxy as a load balancer is uh, pretty exciting. It's really cool. Uh, in, in my opinion, this is where most of the development has come from in the past couple of years. Uh, and you can lo distribute load from your load balancer, or I'm sorry, from Apache as your load balancer to multiple backends different ways. Uh, so by default, um, I think it's going to be by request, and that's just simple one, one, two, two, three, three, passed out through each different backend. Uh, but you can also load balance by traffic, which is the by traffic name. Uh, these are all in 2.2, compiled into Mod Proxy Balancer. In 2.4, they're loaded out as separate modules. So you can, if you have the uh, energy and the time for it, implement your own load balancing algorithm. Uh, but by traffic does it by byte count and response body. And then by busyness is basically a pending request count. So how many things are waiting to talk to this back end? Uh, and then there's heartbeat, which is Exciting, uh, but practically limited. So Mod Heartbeat is, uh, it's a multicast client that spits out to a multicast IP address how it's doing, with some load stats and stuff like that, and then Mod Proxy Balance, or Mod Proxy LB method Heartbeat consumes those messages and then uses that to decide who to go to. Uh, and there's more on the horizon. So. Jim mentioned earlier, and I, I haven't forgotten either, uh, that we're talking about coming up with a generic way for a back end to tell a front end how it's doing. And I'd really like to see something like that implemented uh, because that's going to be a new item on my slide deck. So the next topic about load distribution, I want to point out it doesn't have to be one for one. You can do asymmetric load distribution, so you can say, I want this back end to get more traffic than my other back ends, or perhaps this guy's better hardware so he can take more traffic. And you use the load factor option for that on your balancer member, and we'll, we'll show an example of that. So the higher number is higher load. Uh, you can also mark a back end as a hot standby, and this is pretty important because, well, I mean, the use case I like is my main site's down, but I still have to serve my customers something. How about a static page for the back end? Or maybe I can't give you the most recent data, but I can give you five-minute old data. So that's a good example. Uh, so basically, the worker's not in use until the other guys are dead. Uh, and then selective proxying. This is a, you know, a lot of folks don't know this exists. You can use the, the bang to say, don't proxy this path. You can say, let Apache serve this, because it's really damn good at serving files, and let my expensive application server serve the dynamic stuff. So I have examples of that. 
Um, and it's important to point out each worker has a status. I was hoping to ask a question of the room to my fellow HTTPD developers because I don't know what the difference is between disabled and stopped. I looked in the code and I can't tell. Does anybody know? They are equal. <laughs> I mean, basically it is. I mean, okay. stopped is something you would expect the administrator to detect. So I can't okay. stop this one, whereas disabled means, oh, I detect this error or it's, it's disabled. So practically, okay, so practically speaking, they are the same. Good, I, I'm glad I'm not losing my mind and don't know how to read code. Um, there's also ignoring errors, uh, so you don't want to do that. Please don't. Uh, and there's hot standby, which we talked about earlier, and then workers detected to be in an error state. There's some of the different mechanisms we'll get into later uh, are marked in error. And then there's drain. This is kind of new and it's really, really cool. You can actually say, this guy is still alive, but I don't want him to take on new sessions. If, he, if I would normally select him for the next request, bypass him and go to another option. And then a similar idea with the redirect route. I don't know what does that. So here's an example. Yeah, we have a question. Oh, you're jumping ahead. I'll get to that. We'll, we'll see the statuses in just a moment. That's a good question. I anticipated it. Uh, so here's my example of waiting. Um, so this is actually our first example of a, a load balancer setup. So we'll kind of walk through it. You declare a balancer, which is a, uh, you know, Here's a cluster, and then you give it a name. I call it my cluster because I'm not very exciting and, and inventive. Uh, and there are two members. In this case, there's one, two, three, four, and one, two, three, five. Maybe it's my phone. I don't have GSM cell phone. I have Sprint. I hardly ever have cell reception. <laughs> um, in this example, we use the load factor uh, on these first two members. And then on the third member, we have another load factor, but it's got a lower number. So we're going to get, for every five requests that come through, these guys will serve two, and this guy will serve one. Uh, there are some other parameters you can set, such as the soft max, which I've done here. And then to implement it, we use the proxy pass to point to that balancer. Uh, and there is an important point I want to point out. Make sure your slashes match. If you have a slash here, you need a slash on the end. If you do not have a slash there, do not put a slash on the other end because I've been bitten by that a handful of times. And then there are other parameters that come into play. Uh, so for this example, it's the uh, sticky session uh, example, or uh, parameter, I should say. Oh, Eric has a question. Well, I heard the zinger you gave Jeff. <laughs> I, I was curious if the load factor is implicitly factored into all the, the hypothetical load balancing algorithms that come, or are some of them independent? So lo load the question was whether or not load factor is on all of the uh, algorithms, and it is, but it's up to the algorithm to take that into account. So if you, if you write your own load balancing uh, mechanism, it doesn't just magically start working with load factor. You have to actually put that in the code. Right? We're good? <laughs> I forgot about my work phone. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. Can you still hear me? Did I mess it up? OK. Moving right along. Here's an example of hot standby. Uh, and it, is, it, it really is pretty straightforward. Taking the other example, we turn this guy into a hot standby. So when balance remember 1.2.3.4 and 5 are no longer available, uh, then this guy's going to come into play. So the really good use case that I used earlier is I got to serve something. I can't just tell my customer 503. It, you know, nobody likes that. I tend to get yelled at by my boss when that happens. So you know what? How about five minute old data? Uh, and I will point out, I, I don't have any IPv6 addresses in here, but if your platform supports IPv6, it's working in the proxy. You don't have to do anything special. Uh, and then I'll point out here we're explicitly setting the load balancer or the load balancing mechanism. Uh, here's the example I used earlier of selective proxying. So. I'm not going to proxy slash static. 
but I do want to use this slide to point out that order is very important. Uh, in, in this configuration, static is going to be taken care of first, and then you've got application A and application B being taken care of. And then everything else is going to fall through to that example we had a slide or two ago. Uh, but it's really important to point out, if you stuck this, the, the slash use case all the way up front, that's where all of your traffic's going to go. So it takes the most specific path, and it uses that. The first path it matches, rather. So moving right along, uh, you can't be a good load balancer if you're not setting some sort of session affinity. So the reason this is, uh, this is so important for a proxy is because session replication actually can be very expensive. It depends on what you have in your application because I had the disclaimer earlier, you know your application. Uh, maybe your session actually relies in the backend database. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe you're actually using memory to memory se session replication. That can be terrifically or tremendously expensive for your application server. So there's a couple of ways you can do this. Built in, uh, Mod Proxy Balancer has facilities to do this. Um, depending on your backend, though, it may not work. Uh, and then you can roll your own, which is uh, the example I like to use, and if you smell a recipe coming, then your nose is doing great. Uh, the route parameter comes into play for all of these, though. So the sticky matter with session uh, persistence is that many different formats are used for your session identifier, right? So in this slide on the uh, slide deck, in the notes, I have a couple of different ways different application servers represent their sessions, uh, and it really does differ. Uh, Tomcat uses a dot to separate things. WebSphere uses a semicolon. WebLogic does some really crazy stuff that I don't understand. Uh, your PHP application may do something completely different. It depends on the framework. Um, so it's not always going to work. You really have to know everything on the front end about your back end in order to make it work just out of the box. But we have a fix for that. So this is a really cool recipe. I came across it. I can't claim it because uh, I found it somewhere in 2008 or so. Uh, this is a universal sticky cookie that you can set in Apache, and you don't need to know or care anything about your backend application's way of representing its, its uh, session. So what are we doing? Well, we have the Daniel cluster being configured, and we have two really cool routes, Mercury and Venus, set. Uh, and we're going to use a cookie called Daniel's app underscore sticky. By the way, it looks for a cookie uh, that's not configurable. Um, but we're going to use mod headers to set a cookie called Daniel's app underscore sticky. And since Apache prefers a dot as the separator, we'll just use the word sticky dot. And then after that, we use the environment variable set by mod, set by mod proxy balancer called balancer member or balancer worker route. And we're going to set it on slash. You may want to tighten that down to a more specific path. Uh, and we were only going to set this header if the balancer worker route is changed. And what are the cases? Uh, so if the back end goes down, or if no route was presented by the client, it has to pick one. So this will go out automatically. You don't need to know anything about the back end. It's all right there, set up on the front end. No boos or hisses. So let's talk about connection pooling. This is great. You don't have to do anything. It pretty much just works. Um, connection pooling is pretty important. Uh, we'll talk about it a little bit in the TCP and SSL offload section as well. Um, but what kind of a proxy is not going to maintain that connection, right? You want your proxy to hold those connections open and ready uh, because it may be expensive to set them up. So there are some other parameters that come into play. Uh, you've got the max, soft max, and TTL. Um, don't make the same mistake I did. There's a min parameter. Uh, but Apache will not stand up those connections until they're needed. So if you have, let's say your application tends to have five concurrent requests at a time, you're only going to see five, even if you set your min to 10. It only uses what it needs. Uh, and then the max and soft max are configurable limits. Uh, soft max will. I believe give you an, a warning message in the log, and then a hard maximum is a hard maximum will not go past that. Uh, and then the TTL is if the request is no longer, uh, or I'm sorry, if the connection is no longer needed, it will be cleaned up after this time, 
somewhere down the line. It doesn't just tear it down immediately. Uh, so there's some other parameters that kind of come into play. Uh, there are uh, time to wait to acquire a connection. Uh, you can tune that. There's also the ability to disable reuse of the connection, uh, which is a valid use case. I, I hate to suggest that, but connection pooling can be turned off. And then, of course, keep alive. Uh, now, the keep alive is, it's not like a layer seven HTTP keep alive. It's actually done at the TCP layer. So if you've got a, a load balancer, or I'm sorry, not a load balancer, but a firewall in between your front end and your back end, uh, if it's going to cut off an idle connection, you want to enable that TCP keep alive so it doesn't shut that connection down. Uh, because Apache hates it when its connection is dead, but it thinks it's not. So here's just a quick example of setting all of the parameters for our connection pooling. Uh, this is a pretty limited use case, right? I'm only going to allow 10 connections to a back end. Must be a turd of an application. Um, we have a configured soft max, so if I hit seven, log a warning, let me know. Uh, my server administrators can get in and do something about that. Uh, and then if I hit 10, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to turn the user away with a 503. I think it's a 503. And then after 10 seconds, if the connection's no longer in use, go clean it up sometime later. We good? I'm actually moving ahead of time. <laughs> All right, Eric, hit me. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I would have to look at the code to know. So the question was, if you hit max, but session persistence is enabled and you, you're going to go to that worker, um, what's it going to do? And I'm not sure. I think it would return a 503. That's my gut. I think it would just turn the user away, unless you turn on no failover. I'm not sure. I'll have to test that. That's a good question. We don't have, we never tell the front end that we are using any session of or any session persistence. Right. Or if we are, we're not telling how aggressively how bad is it. Well, there is a no failover parameter um, as well, which will say if I have to break session, just return a 503, period. Um, but I'm not sure in your example what would happen. So moving on to the next topic, uh, failover and health check. So if you're going to have a number of backend servers that you may or may not use, you need to know if they're healthy. Uh, and we can kind of do that. Um, it's important to note that the failover capability really only exists at the connection level. Uh, if I can't establish a TCP connection to the backend, it's going to hop onto the next backend and everything's going to be fine. Your user's never going to know the difference. Uh, unfortunately, SSL errors will go back to the user. And it wasn't until 2.2.18 uh, did that actually become an error condition. So if an SSL handshake failure happens to the back end, that back end will be taken out of service until timeout is reached. Uh, and then hung and slow back end errors will also go back to the user, uh, depending on how it hangs. Right? So if it hangs at a TCP connection, let's say it can't establish that connection through the firewall, uh, then that's going to actually fail over. But if the request makes it to the back end and the back end sits there on its rump for an hour and a half before responding, the user is going to experience that pain. Uh, in 2.2.2.5 and 2.4.5, we added the fail on timeout parameter. So if a back end doesn't respond after 30 seconds, just assume it's dead. Uh, and that comes with a big warning. Know your application well because that could be a bad thing. Which brings me to my one gripe about HTTPD in a proxy scenario. We don't have a monitoring or a probing mechanism. It sucks, we need it, but I can't implement it myself because I don't have the capability. Uh, in order to have a failure encountered, that requires real live traffic to be flowing through the instance. So you have a request from a user coming through that may end up creating an error, and that's good, because that takes it out of service, but I really don't want that user to get that error in the first place. Uh, so we got to come up with a way around it. Uh, I remember when I gave this presentation in 2010, I, I said, in the future, on this slide. Um, and I, I honestly don't even remember what we were saying about this. I know there is a lot of 
uh, churn because it's difficult. You have to maintain that connection pool. You have to make sure you're not exceeding your keep alives, all that stuff. So it gets complicated. I understand why it's not there. I just wish it really was. Uh, and I do want to point out, I skipped this a few steps back. Um, it's my recommendation when you have a proxy server terminating the request uh, to open up a connection to the back end and set your back end for an infinite keep a lifetime out. That will allow you to keep that connection open to the back end forever. Because you remember, the back end is going to have the same kind of timeouts Apache will have. So if your back end decides, hey, Apache, you haven't said anything to me in 30 seconds, I'm going to close the connection, you're kind of losing a lot of the benefits of connection pooling. Good? Did I skip too far? Yeah. So how do we get past this whole no monitoring capability built in? So you can set the connection timeout. Uh, that's good for a user experience standpoint. So if the back end isn't going to answer in five seconds, nobody here wants to wait for a web page for five seconds. So set that something low. You know, if you're uh, inside a DMZ or if you're in a local environment, you can expect to have a TCP connection well under a second, I would think. So you can set that low. You can also set the proxy timeout and fail on timeout parameter I talked about earlier. So proxy timeout's going to be used. It's an IO timeout. If the back end does not respond in, say, 10 seconds, then it will be considered an error, and it can be taken out of service. Uh, again, this may be bad for you, depending on your application. If your application times out a lot, don't turn this on, because you're going to be taking it out of service when it's perfectly healthy but slow as usual. I don't know. Uh, and then I talked about fail on status, or actually I don't think I talked about it. Fail on status was added in 2.2.17. Uh, obviously it exists in 2.4. Uh, and this is a way to say if the back end throws this response code, take it out of service. So the use case example I have is a WebSphere application server. When it's starting up, it'll actually open up its TCP transport before the application may have finished initializing. And if you submit a request to WebSphere, it will return a 503 saying, service unavailable, I can't help you. So in the balancer, you can say, consider that an error. Take it out of service. Give it another 60 seconds to start. And then finally, well, the last mitigating control for the, uh, the lack of monitoring is to create your own monitoring traffic. And set up a cron job to hit your website every minute. Who knows? The next important point about a, a proxy, a load balancer, is you need to be able to do dynamic modification of the members. And this is a really cool feature that Apache accelerates quite well at. Uh, the balancer manager is how you're going to do this. Uh, there's a great selection of parameters that you can modify in the balancer manager, both on the, the balancer as well as the individual workers. Uh, so looking at the parameters in the balancer, you, you can change your sticky identifier. I don't know why that would happen during runtime, but hey, if, if it does, you're set. Uh, you can change your timeouts. You can decide whether or not you're going to fail over. Uh, so we talked about you know, the no failover option. If I can't keep my session, then just return an error to the user. Uh, the number of times I'm going to try to fail over to another back end before I give up. Uh, and then the load balancing method. You can change that in real time. Uh, and then again, workers can be added if growth is set, but you can't ever really remove a worker. Uh, you can disable it or stop it. Uh, but it's still going to be in the balancer. Uh, and then on the worker, you can change the load factors. So let's say this guy needs to get some more traffic or less. You can set your LB set, route, and redirect as well. And redirect, I, I kind of alluded to earlier, it says if this worker gets selected, choose this other worker instead. Uh, and I do want to point out this is real time. This may be production. So be safe out there. And there's the answer to your question earlier. How do we do this? So how do we get stats? How do we modify our members? That actually looks really terrible up on screen. Uh, can anyone read that? Up on screen, you have your, uh, your load balancer manager. Uh, in, I have an old build of Apache up on screen. Uh, in, in the newer versions, you're going to see a note about whether or not changes here are persisted and whether or not they're inherited from server level. Uh, but up on screen, we have a load balancer. We're going to call it test underscore cluster. Uh, and it, we have some stats, right? There are four members that may be part of this balancer. Two of them are actually in use today. 
Uh, there is the name of the sticky session. We have the number of counters for timeout and failover attempts, or um, not counters, but the parameters. And then we have some stats about the workers. So how are my backends doing? How many times have they been elected by the load balancing er algorithm? How many times have we seen errors? Uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then their current status is listed as well. Um, on the bottom half, on the left-hand side, because everybody can clearly read this wonderfully scaled image, uh, those are the ways you change different parameters on the balancer. And then the bottom half on the right-hand side is how you change individual workers. Uh, so in this example, there's really only one. Uh, I know, I know uh, Jim Riggs, for example, has uh, probably a page and a half in his, uh, his environment we've talked about in the past. So every balancer you've configured in that virtual host is gonna show up here. And to turn that on, uh, you basically just need to set a handler for that particular location and then hit it. Uh, I strongly suggest you enable some sort of authorization and authentication on that URL. Um, I also strongly encourage you not to make it open to the public internet if you can avoid it. But you know, I'm not gonna tell you how to run your environment. Uh, and then there's a bit of uh, additional information about the balancer manager. I do want to point out, so there's a nonce that is configured or is configurable. By default, it's a, uh, a randomly generated uh, GUID when HTTPD starts. Uh, this is a token that's passed around with every request you make to the balancer manager, and it's important because if you don't present that token, you get nothing, okay? You can't make any changes. Uh, this protects against cross-site request forgery attacks, um, so you can configure it like a shared secret, you can leave it unset, and it will, um, it will just generate one, or you can set it to none, and it will ignore it and you know, open you up to that type of attack. Uh, there's also XML output. So XML output is great for machines who like to read information. Uh, this is really cool in a cloud environment. Let's say you have a cloud management system that needs to know the status of your backends, and you're using Apache as the load balancer for all of those backends. This is how it can be done. Uh, it's REST-like, but it's not fully RESTful. The balancer manager is. Uh, there are three parameters that come into play, the balancer, the worker, and then the nonce parameter uh, being as part of the URL. Uh, there, is a, there is indeed a to-do in the source code to flesh this out more. I'll get to that sooner or later if somebody doesn't beat me to it. Uh, and new in 2.4.4 is the ability to persist any changes you made in the balancer manager to a file on the file system. And then when you restart Apache, it picks that file up and it re-implements that. Um, I say be careful out there because, you know, the good thing about that is, you know, you've got real-time changes uh, and it's persisting. And then the bad thing about that is you've got real-time changes and it persists. So your configuration may not match what's actually out there. And for me, the configuration is, you know, the, the, the holy word of what my Apache instance is doing. So uh, to have that chance for uh, disparity uh, is a little frightening to me as a system administrator. That's configurable, though. You can turn it on or off. And then another really important part of being a proxy is you can shape traffic. You can do whatever the hell you want to the traffic. It's amazing the amount of things you can change. We have a, a question. My mic is off? No, no, it's working. He says it's working. Can you guys hear me? We're good? Okay. Thank you. Oh, did we go mono? Okay. So right channel good, left channel not so good. Um, so shaping the traffic. You can do all kinds of stuff. Uh, being good internet citizen, as I said earlier, we're going to send fewer bytes than we, as few bytes as we can, so you can cache. You can use uh, mod deflate to compress. Um, mod cache is, uh, you can do a tremendous amount of stuff here. There's way too much to cover, uh, but I encourage you guys to take a look at it. Uh, you can also shape via these different modules. Mod proxy HTML is new, and uh, it allows you to specify specific elements in the HTML response that you want to mess with. Uh, a really great example, I, I think it may have been Rich's example, is let's say you have a third party application deployed in your environment. You can't go changing that, so you have to use the proxy to change it. Uh, the use case I have for it is, um, you know, you have a third party app, developer says it's going to be $50,000 to change that URL, and you say, well, I can do it for free with the proxy. 
kiss my ass. Uh, and then I, one of my favorite modules is moddump.io. Uh, it's important in a proxy, especially in uh, an environment where you're doing any sort of integration testing. Uh, sometimes clients are not well behaved. They think they are. Well, you can see the exact request and the exact response using moddump.io. This is great for a test environment. And regrettably, sometimes in a production environment, too. So the sky's the limit. You know, there's no way I can really cover everything. Um, there's a couple of other notes in the uh, slide notes for your uh, perusal to see some of the other ideas. Uh, so here's an example of traffic shaping. It's been a while since we've had an example, so let me throw one up here. Uh, in this example, we've got a balancer, uh, and on the slash app location, we're going to substitute all occurrences of 127001 on a certain port with the external name of my web page. Uh, so this is the exact use case that saved us 50,000 theoretical dollars a minute ago. Uh, you can also set a request header to let your back end know what environment they're running in. So let's say the back end is, again, expensive code that developer wants to charge you a million dollars to change. Uh, you can give it signals from the proxy to the back end. And then, of course, I encourage you to compress textual content because it's fewer bytes on the internet and more bandwidth for me. Um, you know, there's some other ideas. You can use the security filter here, too. You can uh, cache some items. You know, anything you can do with HTTP, you can do here in the proxy, uh, which will take me to the next topic about TCP and SSL offloading. Uh, let the proxy handle that because Apache is damn good at that, right? So I call it the pipeline concept. If you have a 1,000 users out there hitting your web page all at one time, Apache's gonna sort through those requests, and when it can make a request to a backend, it's gonna do that, and it's gonna broker those requests to the multiple backends. Instead of having potentially expensive backend resources tied up talking to a user who's slow, you can have Apache with its comparatively lighter resources tied up waiting for that user. Uh, think of the, the, the slow Loris attack, right? If, if imagine if you were doing that on a heavy backend application server, it would be dead in seconds. Um, and, and this all works because of the beauty of Keep Alive. Um, you know, so again, the connection pooling magic, it's all there. SSL benefits as well. Um, depending on what kind of SSL implementation you use, it could be very expensive to stand up that connection on the back end. Uh, so you can terminate SSL at Apache and then speak clear text to the back end, or vice versa, however you want to cut it. Uh, either way, we'll be more efficient. But the use case that I've been really dying to talk about is, is this Node.js use case. So uh, has anyone here heard of Node.js? It's basically you take the Chromium JavaScript engine and you run it server side really fast. Uh, it's great for, you know, I.O. bound or items, that are, or, or I'm sorry, code that's waiting on an external resource. Uh, so I had a friend approach me. And he said, hey, uh, we got this Node.js app, and it's cranking at about you know, 50,000 requests a second. But then as soon as I turned on SSL, it took a dump. So SSL and Node.js, if you guys have, have tried it, it sucks. It is absolutely terrible. So what did we do? Well, I said, hey, have you heard of these things called Unix domain sockets? They said, yeah, yeah. I said, why don't you make your Node.js process answer on UDS? I'll tell Apache to proxy on UDS. We'll terminate SSL here in Apache where we're damn good at it. And by the way, I'm going to pass certificate information to you in HTTP headers, which you could not get in Node.js. And we'll see how we do. Let's see what the performance is. 36,000 requests a second. 36,000 requests a second. Let that sink in. How exciting is that? Um, when, when we turned on, um, I think when we turned on proxy on localhost, it dropped down to uh, 10,000 less than that. So by cutting out that TCP overhead, we improved 10,000 requests a second. I'm excited. And then we get into the topic of attack mitigation, right? A good proxy is going to do whatever it can to defend its backend resources. This is why we have DMZs. This is why there are separate security zones. Uh, so there are security modules in Apache. Uh, I talked about the slow Loris attack. That's an option. You got uh, mod rec timeout also. 
mod security. There's, there's a ton of them out there. Uh, I encourage you to use them. Uh, I don't have any uh, personal experience with mod security, but I, everyone I've talked to loves it. Um, so if you guys have you know, some experience with it, I'd like to hear about it. Uh, and, and you can use Apache to bridge those DMZ boundaries, right? So you have your web layer, you've got your application layer, you've got your data layer. You can put Apache out front, terminate that request that may or may not have a malicious payload, do whatever you want there in a lower security zone before you get to the tighter security zones later. Uh, and it's also very good to have standards enforcement so you know your backend application can only speak HTTP don't let Apache talk to a user that's not speaking HTTP. Um, I'm sure it's possible that you point an FTP client on port 80 if you really wanted to. Uh, you're not going to get past Apache. Uh, and then, of course, filtering, blocking, restricting, authorization, authentication, all that stuff. The sky is the limit. The authorization overhaul in 2.4, authentication and authorization overhaul, uh, is really exciting. The nesting of authorization groups, grouping of authorization, and all that stuff, it's, it's super cool. Uh, there's a whole lot that we could cover, uh, but we're really not going to have the time to do that today. So, that being said, I have exhausted my supply of examples, and I'd like to ask if there are any questions, scenarios, thoughts, comments. See if Eric has another zinger for me. Rich? Uh, just a real quick comment. Um, I'm getting a 403 on your uh, slides on your... I have to change the permissions. Over. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> about the proxy, uh, but uh, in the prototype. Okay, so there is a presentation I coming up. slides with performance uh, showing the differences between the, uh, the Java uh, uh, SS7 and the HTTP1. Okay. So just if I want to Cool. APR. APR is it? And APR also. We have a question here. So I'm on 2.2, and I'm using LD step to hide servers that I don't want sticky traffic going to. Should I be using drain now for 2.4? Because that's how I drain traffic. Or... Uh, no, so drain is used for, uh, well, no, I think 2.2. Um, did we implement drain in 2.2? I don't remember. I don't think it, was, it made it back. Uh, no, if you want to take a server out of service later, is that what you mean? Okay. When I upgraded 2.4, should I be using? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, upgrade to 2.4, that's first, and then use drain. Um, because with LBSED, you're still going to get traffic to it, new traffic. Um, what you could do uh, is set the redirection route to a different worker. LBSED, yes, I was thinking, you're right, you're right, I'm sorry. No, you're right. LB set will do that. Sorry. So you're you're, you're fine with LB set. I was thinking load factor. So you can keep doing it the same way, or you can just switch to using drain. Okay. Yeah. Good point. Yeah, so that said, uh, check the manual before you answer questions. All right, well, great. Uh, guys, I, I appreciate your attention, and uh, you know, I, I'm here for the community. So if you guys want to talk about this stuff, or if you want to just talk about what beer is good nearby, I'd like to talk about that too. So I'll see you guys around at the conference. Uh, and I put the URL again of the presentation so you can bookmark it and try it later after I fix permissions. Thanks a lot.